The human eye is a miraculous instrument, perceptive, sensitive, forever tuned to the pulsating wavelengths of light. Yet the eye is hemmed in by horizons. It cannot see over a hillside or beyond the haze of distance. To extend the range of human eyesight, man developed marvelously sensitive instruments, binoculars. giant telescopes to probe the furthest span of space. But I see through you! Hey guys, how's it going? So I finally got around to making a video on the vestibular system, and I cannot emphasize enough how important the vestibular system is for us to be able to function at all. Basically, the vestibular system is our internal gyroscope and it is responsible for the stabilization of our vision, spatial orientation, and balance. And it also plays a big part in the operation of other systems in our body. What's funny is that not only is the vestibular system essential to our existence, but it also cannot work without gravity. The sword cuts both ways, NASA, and gravity is our friend too. I'm sorry, but the 1969 science fiction story is impossible when you realize that the vestibular system cannot function without gravity in imaginary space. You know, the story where so-called astronauts hopped onto their rocket ship, piloted it beyond low Earth orbit, all the way 237,000 miles to our orbiting moon, then they separated into a lunar module and manually descended and magically and flawlessly landed in one try on the unknown spinning rock surface while the other guy stayed in the magical orbit of the moon. On the surface, Buzz Lightyear and Stretch Armstrong had a grand old time. They played, conducted a bunch of science experiments, planted a flag. Then they blasted off from the moon and docked with the command module in open space with no coordinate system, manually, visually, and with a few delayed remote controls from Houston, all very accurate down to a few feet in order to make the magical joining of the two tiny space capsules in the massive emptiness of outer space. And also to navigate, they used a sextant-like instrument to visually line up the Earth and a star or planet billions of miles away and triangulate their position. What a fantastic story! All this technical work, which the supercomputers of today can't even replicate, we lost the instructions on how to get to the moon, they did all of this with an impaired vestibular system due to the lack of gravity in low Earth orbit and then the absence of gravity on their way to the moon and then the shift back to one-sixth of Earth's gravity on the Moon itself. One of the biggest problems with these claims is that the vision stabilization feature of the vestibular system would have been impaired for these astronauts. The vestibulo-ocular reflex, as I mentioned in my gyroscopic eye video, is what enables us to have a stable field of vision. This means that your vestibular system detects gravity and then uses the vertical orientation of gravity to stabilize your vision. When you move around, look around, or operate controls, your field of vision is stationary. Things don't move every time you look around or move even slightly. The muscles in your eye will compensate for head movements or rotations so that you can function properly. Without this feature, every slight movement will cause your field of vision to shift or tilt or even spin, which usually leads to vertigo and sickness. Now, NASA is really in a pickle here when it comes to the vestibular system. The very brief mentions from anyone at NASA on this subject are that you quickly get used to it and can work in any position, upside down, whatever. Well, the problem is, the only way for that to be true is if your eyes are not detecting gravity and not trying to stabilize your vision. However, if your eyes are not stabilizing your vision, every head movement will cause your vision to shift, making it impossible to function or accomplish the simplest of tasks. 
So either your eyes are locked in place and your vision is now like a shaky camera that never stops, which makes it impossible to function, or your eyes are detecting gravity and stabilizing your vision, or at least trying to. But then if that's the case, you cannot work so easily upside down because you would know you're upside down. You would feel the difference. You see, this really is a catch-22 for space claims. The moon landing story is particularly suspect because on the way to the moon, there would not have been any gravity at all, so there could not have been any vision stabilization at that point. And yet we're supposed to believe that with a shaky field of vision, which makes most people sick with vertigo to the point of not being able to move at all, the magical NASA astronauts manually piloted two spacecraft to a spinning rock and landed. Vision stabilization is dependent upon gravity. Otherwise, there is no reference plane for it to stabilize to. Either you have vision stabilization, which makes working upside down not so easy, or you don't, which makes functioning at all not so easy. So either way, I have never heard a good explanation from NASA about how astronauts can function in microgravity or exactly how they deal with the vision stabilization feature or lack thereof. And by the way, the NASA researcher speaking in this video is Joan Vernikos, and I actually like her work on gravity and how it is essential for life, sort of like radiation. She is one of the few people out there sounding the alarm on how bad sitting is for our health. She stresses how simply standing up every 20 minutes will do more for your health than exercise. Now, I don't know why she doesn't see some of the inconsistencies at NASA. I don't know if she knows that there's something wrong or if she is oblivious to it, but... I never thought I'd, I'd live to say this when in the first... <laughs> because there was such an emphasis on the vestibular system in NASA in the early days, and always has been. But the vestibular system is, is ending up being far more important than merely balance and coordination. I'm not underrating balance and coordination. I think you want it and you need it. But it is, it is the clearinghouse for blood pressure regulation. It is a clearinghouse for uh, a whole lot of activities, for muscle, for bone. Now there's, there's research on bone uh, being mediated through the vestibular system. So when the vestibular system goes silent, literally silent, uh, you're in trouble. Your payments fast through your life just races past you. Wake up, the matrix has you. Wake up, the matrix has you. We are enslaved like cattle, held back with chains and shackles. Wake up, the matrix has you. Wake up, the matrix has you. In debt, your payments fast through your life just races past you. Wake up, the matrix has you. Wake up, the matrix has you. We are enslaved like cattle, held back with chains and shackles. Wake up, the matrix has you. Wake up, the Matrix has you. There is a hidden agenda at play. Same old bullshit, but a different... The human ear is divided into three compartments. The external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The inner ear contains the spiral-shaped cochlea, where sound waves are transduced into neural signals, and the vestibular complex, which contains the receptors for our sense of equilibrium. The central, egg-shaped cavity is the vestibule, which contains a pair of membranous sacs, the saccule and the utricle. Inside the utricle and saccule are hair cells similar to those in the organ of corti. The hairs are clustered in the macula, where their processes are embedded in a gelatinous mass and lie under a thin layer of crystals called otoliths. When the head tilts, gravity moves the crystal mass and distorts the stereocilia of the hair cells. This is how the saccule and utricle provide information about position with respect to gravity. Behind the vestibule is the third portion of the bony labyrinth, known as the semicircular canals. The canals project from the posterior region of the vestibule and are responsible for the detection of head motion in three spatial planes. The anterior duct 
senses forward and backward motion. The posterior duct detects moving up and down. The lateral duct senses moving left to right. Each canal contains a membranous semicircular duct where angular momentum is sensed. At the base of each duct is an expansion called the ampulla. Within the ampulla, long stereocilia of hair cells are embedded in the cupula, which sticks out into the endolymph. When your head moves, the endolymph moves the cupula and stimulates the stereocilia. I discovered gravity when I was recruited from uh, teaching at uh, Ohio State University Medical School. I was recruited by NASA in its very early years. I was hired because of my stress research uh, expertise. I was one of six that formed the core and of my biomedical researchers at uh, Ames Research Center in California. Soon we were asking questions like, what happens when we live without gravity? Nobody knew. No, none of us knew. As we live in planet Earth, our development, growth, and lifespan are influenced by four fundamental forces of nature. Gravity, electromagnetism, including light, and strong and weak nuclear interactions. All these factors influence our life in this planet. Gravity and light, we now know, are crucial to health, as well as to behavior. From the moment we are born, from the relative weightlessness of our mother's womb, remember that. Being in the womb is like being an astronaut in space. And harder still while wearing a spacesuit that has to be able to protect an astronaut from the vacuum of space. Without gravity, we do not develop properly. For instance, a child that is born with cerebral palsy that does not, cannot move on its own, cannot sense this vertical direction of gravity properly, and therefore does not develop normally. It is gravity that gives us our sense of direction and acceleration. Without those, we have no sense of balance and coordination. Returning space travelers lose their balance and coordination. They basically are like a child. So uh, just remind our viewers how hostile environment is space because uh, I know in a conversation that we had yesterday with astronomer Derek Pitts uh, out of Philadelphia, he was talking about uh, the effects of space radiation and how space is a very hostile environment for the human body. Oh, no question about it. I mean, they're flying in a vacuum in space. Their orbital velocity is five miles a second which is hard to imagine. So think about it more in terms of 86 football fields a second. Uh, extremely fast, space radiation, extremes of temperatures, and then of course the re-entry that they're going through to come home, where they're slowing down from five miles a second to this very jarring touchdown on the step of Kazakhstan. It is a, it's an amazing experience by all accounts. All right, we see someone else now being pulled from the Soyuz capsule. Can't quite see. That's Scott Kelly. That I mean, is that's, Scott uh, Kelly. After U.S. astronaut pumping his fist in the air. Wow, with a smile, it looks like, on his face. Uh, there you saw giving the thumbs up there as he is being placed into uh, that recliner that you mentioned. Yeah, he'll be placed there soon. Everyone just step back. Here comes, we step back. Step back and don't interfere. And we're seeing a big smile from Scott Kelly there. You can see just to his right, Steve Gilmore, uh, Scott's prime flight surgeon for his year in space. No stranger to cold landings in Kazakhstan. This is his fourth mission, his second landing in a Soyuz. Uh, 520 total days uh, in space across his uh, space flight career. 340 days in this historic year in space. Picture that is father and son cosmonaut heritage that has spent several decades of Russian space history. Everything as we, taught, as we were taught. And we just had a... I'm Bryce Salvador, uh, retired captain, defenseman uh, from the NHL. 
Uh, I played seven years with the St. Louis Blues and seven years with the New Jersey Devils. Hockey's been uh, just an integral part of my life, and and when that was taken away from me because of you know a vestibular issue, it was really tough to deal with. You know, it just it just changed my personality. I couldn't go out and do stuff. Couldn't even get in the car. Couldn't drive. My kids were still young. Um, at the point, they hadn't really at an age they could understand or remember me playing, and so. You know, I didn't like. I wanted them to remember me as, you know, as as a, as a player playing, um, instead of just you know a picture on the wall. And also in your inner ear, you have these three little tubes that are filled with fluid, and those are your inner station tubes. Those tubes help you get a sense of of which way is up and which way is down. Well, the second you get into space, none of that works. Because you, if you're here in space, you can work on the floor, you can work on the ceiling, you can work on the walls, you can work right side up, upside down, and it's, it's very, very disorienting. So when you first get into space, one of the first things you have to do is really kind of come to appreciate that, okay, I'm in space now and I can really work in all three dimensions. I'm not limited to just working in one plane. <laughs> Returning space travelers lose their balance and coordination. They basically are like a child. Good. Welcome home. Oh. Back to us. <sighs> I wanted to do that for a whole year. If you have one bucket that holds two gallons and another bucket that holds five gallons, how many buckets do you have? Two? Thank you.
Lord, I wonder what's the jack of my child.